working in the film industry is a is a love hate relationship all the time. HMS Critter Productions is a uh, prop and model shop. We build props, models, costumes, prototype toys, a whole range of different things for uh, the film industry, the toy industry, and in some cases uh, even for uh, like NASA and stuff like that. We'll do some prototyping or some test work for them. HMS Critter Productions started uh, in my garage uh, when my partner and I left another company that I was the vice president of, Proper Effects, and we created HMS Creative Productions in uh, 1998. I started doing props a long time ago in my garage, you know, just like most, most teenagers. I think um, really like prop making, depending on the person, is almost like a drug. You know, when you're in the thick of it and doing all these different things, you have that rush going and you have that, that feeling, you know, that you're looking for. I like the challenge of things come in, we create them, solve the problems, get the product to the customer, whether that be a toy prototype or, um, or a movie prop. It's not always about, you know, like, oh, I'm working on this big film. I'm not necessarily always concerned about what film I'm working on. It's usually, am I enjoying myself? Am I having fun? Am I being creative? Working in the film industry is a, is a love-hate relationship all the time. You can have a great time on the lowest budget movie and have the worst time on the highest budget movie. One of my favorite shows recently is uh, working on The Hobbit. Um, I was asked to come down and work on The Hobbit uh, by Richard Taylor. I went down and I was there for two and a half months. What is a great place to work? I worked on uh, some of the orc costume parts. Um, as well as uh, the prototyping of the uh, white wog and the brown wog. You may be working for 20, 24, 25 hours straight before you get to go home. Um, but uh, that's just the name of the game here in, with, with the film industry. Currently, we're, we're working with the Disney company. Uh, we do quite a few uh, projects for, their, uh, for Disney World. Disneyland. Other things I've, I've enjoyed working on. I enjoyed working on Star Trek. I worked on Star Trek from halfway through the first season of Next Generation all the way through Enterprise. Did First Contact. 17, 18 years working on Star Trek. There were interesting new techniques invented. Since Star Trek was such a long part of my life, um, I can honestly say, yeah, it, I, I really enjoyed working on all the different Star Trek franchises. We've made anywhere from the chess communicators, uh, from Next Generation, through the DS9 phasers, tricorders, medical devices. There's a whole variety of, of, of pieces. I mean, it's, it's, there's thousands of, of props that we made for the show. We went from a, um, what they called the Dustbuster phaser to the Cobra phaser a um, boomerang phaser, that's what we called it, it was a boomerang phaser. We had a very good relationship with the prop masters as well as the um, art directors and the, in some cases, illustrators. I was at, at uh, Paramount literally every other morning to drop off props. And in many cases our uh, prop schedules were anywhere from three to five days maximum. I was on Star Trek set quite a few times taking care of our props or costume pieces. One of the props that sticks out in my mind as far as from DS9, we uh, got a uh, call on, at, on Thursday evening with drawings of a Bajoran phaser rifle. Well that Bajoran phaser rifle was pretty complicated and they wanted us to create the rifle, make molds, and create 18 copies of that rifle fully painted for Monday morning. We had almost every single person from our staff uh, working the entire weekend just to get all these rifles done. We had to have the master for the rifle done by Friday evening so we could get it all molded uh, before Saturday afternoon, two-piece mold. Is it gonna be handled by a stuntman? Is it a background prop? Is it a, you know, a hero prop? All these things um, all 
have to be calculated into how you're going to do the prop, let alone into your budget. When you had a budget, you had to meet the budget you couldn't go over. Because if you went over the budget, it was coming out of your side of, the, of, of, of everything. Star Trek to me, when I was a kid, I used to love watching Star Trek with Spock and Kirk. Um, and seeing the props and the different costumes and makeup. And I was like, oh, cool. And it kind of inspired me a little bit, you know, because it's, it's, it's very creative. I actually, you know, wanted to be making things. In reality, uh, on Next Generation DS9 and Voyager, it was actually really frowned upon to actually uh, admit that you're a fan of the show. Um, and, and it's understandable because if you have somebody who's a fanatical fan, then you never know if you sat that piece down over there on set, that it wouldn't disappear. Most of the people who were on the creative side were fans of Star Trek. It's just that they were professional fans of Star Trek. One of my favorites is, is uh, Steve Horch and myself designed the Mark IX tricorder uh, in somewhere about the middle of DS9, I think it was. We made a prototype of it, sent it off with the prop master to uh, Rick Berman, who made a few notes. We changed it, he approved it, and we started making them. This is the, the second rendition of the, the tricorder that we made for, uh, for the show, and uh, this is the approved model from Rick Berman. As soon as he gave us the go ahead, we had three days to make six of them. Uh, which was, was a feat of magic unto itself. Uh, you know, there's more than enough light in here to make everybody happy. There's movement, there's, you know, there's something going on with this tricorder. It's not uh, just a static, a couple of lights blinking here and there. This is actually everything you could think of. Uh, lights everywhere are blinking, moving, so it actually has a function to it. That was one of the major things that uh, Rick Berman wanted to make sure that we had was movement, make it look like it's functioning. This is one of the pieces that, that I'm actually really proud of because of the fact that it did everything that we wanted it to do in a little tiny box. And, and, and it's actually become one of the most popular tricorders besides the original series tricorder. It's one of those portfolio pieces that, uh, you know, almost a once in a lifetime kind of thing. The industry has been changing a lot. We've went from, you know, having small TV screens to TV screens that we can actually put into a prop now. We don't have to be tethered now. We can actually do graphics for a, a tricorder, for instance, <clears throat> and load it onto a, small, a micro SD card and install it into the screen itself. You can have all kinds of props now that do everything you've ever wanted them to do. If you're going to stay in this industry, you need to uh, not only embrace the old, but you're gonna to have to embrace the new now. There's so many new changes coming into the film industry from outside, uh, from manuf different manufacturing techniques and so on. So you don't, you're no longer limited to trying to sculpt something out of a block of clay or uh, a piece of wood, you can now sculpt it in a computer and have it output as almost as an, a, a finished product now. Everybody's afraid that all this, these new technologies are gonna be taking away from uh, all these jobs that you know people think that they're gonna lose. Well, there are a lot of people who were physical builders before who are now getting into the 3D field and are uh, much more advanced than the people coming straight out of schools. To continue on in this industry, or actually any industry at this moment, you have to move with the technology, not against it. I could be at home and have a, an idea and suddenly turn the machine on from home and start printing a part at 
12 o'clock at night and when I come in the next morning, it, if depending on uh, how long the duration of the part's gonna take to, uh, to print, I may have the new prototypes sitting waiting for me when I get there. I think the advantages are gonna outweigh the disadvantages in the long run. As long as we don't lose sight of the past, we're good. And, well, as long as they don't actually invent the replicator, we'll still be in business. <laughs>